Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Mac, we can hear you. Excellent. Hi, Meg. How are you? Good, Tony. How are you? Very well. Apologies. That took me a while. I got uh, uh, just a little bit of trouble getting in, but I'm in. Done. Right. Here we all are. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I'll just have to look at how I do the sharing oh, yes. again. Oh, that's that one there. Hello, Prof. Hi, Prof. How are you today? Very Hi, good to see you. you. Yeah. It's uh, quite, uh, quite hot here in Bogor. Oh, good. It's, uh, it's very nice and sunny here in Melbourne today, oh. but, but quite cool uh, oh. this time of year, of course. Uh, and ha have you met Meg before, Prof? Oh, not yet. Yeah. Very, first time. Very, very nice to meet you. Nice and and I, I think we're actually live already, so we might uh, we might get going. But very nice to have have, uh, have met you just before we started. Oh, yeah. uh, so so salamat siang dan salamat datang. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> good, oh, good afternoon and <laughs> good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Uh, so we're delighted uh, to welcome you today to our seminar on uh, One Health for Society, Animals and Environment. And we have with us, of course, our two illustrious speakers, Professor Tony Capon from the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and Professor Srihadi Agung Priyono from the yeah. Institute for Danian Bogor. Uh, and I am Nagarjirio. I'm going to be your moderator for today. Uh, and I'm the Head of International Programs at Climateworks Australia. And at Climateworks, we focus on catalyzing the transition to net zero emissions across Australia and Asia Pacific. And I, I might just actually ask our speakers to mute themselves just for a moment, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, and then I'll, I'll ask you to unmute when it's your turn to speak. Wonderful. Uh, so Climate Works uh, actually works extensively in Indonesia, and we have a growing team on the ground uh, in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And our work, our work uh, in, in Indonesia includes uh, providing guidance to PTSME uh, in partnership with the University of Indonesia uh, to ensure infrastructure investment aligns with climate and sustainable development goals. Mm. We're also working with OJECA uh, on catastrophe risk insurance. And we have a project in partnership with the Environmental Bamboo Foundation focused on achieving landscape restoration and enhanced livelihoods for Indigenous communities through bamboo, bamboo forestry. And this is just a few of the, uh, the pieces of work that we, we are currently pursuing in Indonesia. And Climate Works is actually part of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute within uh, Monash University. And of course, the Institute also has a very long history of collaboration with Indonesia, including two projects that are currently underway. One that is focused on revitalising informal settlements and their environments, and another project focused on the Chitterum River. And both projects have a core focus on enhancing human health through the restoration of the natural environment. Mm. And, and of course, finally, Monash is delighted to be developing a campus in Jakarta, which we hope to begin operations towards the end of this year. And um, I'm also very pleased, particularly pleased to be the moderator today because ClimateWorks also has a long friendship with IPB through our combined work on global deep decarbonisation pathways, uh, working with Professor Rosaldi Bohr. Oh, uh, and so, yes, yeah. And so today is the final in a series of five joint webinars uh, between our two universities. And today, uh, the focus is on One Health for Society, Animals and Environment. And our speakers will talk about uh, the need to think more holistically about the connections between the health of humans, other species and our planet. Uh, because ultimately, we're all part of one vast uh, planetary ecosystem. And uh, you know, with COVID-19 and the increasing impacts of climate change, these are just two examples of what happens when things get out of balance with clear connections between the transmission of diseases from animals to humans in the case of COVID and between our planetary health uh, and human well-being in the case of climate change. So as our speakers will describe today, uh, the solutions to today's com uh, challenges are, 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 are complex uh, and they must be interdisciplinary to ensure robust health across these three interconnected dimensions of environment, human and, and animal health. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our, our speakers now. Um, so firstly, our first speaker today is Professor Tony Capon, and he's the director of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and holds a chair in planetary health in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University. And Tony is a public health uh, physician and an authority in environmental health and health promotion uh, with research focuses on urbanisation, sustainable development and human health. And Professor Srihadi Agung Priyono is the Dean of Faculty at the Veterinary Medicine at IPB uh, University. He graduated as a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from IPB in 1986 and received his PhD from Gifu University in Japan in 1995. He's also completed postdoc training in both uh, Japan and Germany and Professor Srihadi's field of expertise is veterinary autonomy, uh, sorry, veterinary anatomy and animal behaviour in relation to disease occurrence. I see that he has published extensively on these topics. Uh, so we'll first hear from our two speakers and we'll then have about 20 minutes for question and answers at the end. And so what I encourage our, our audience to do is to post their questions uh, via the chat function at any time uh, throughout uh, throughout the presentations, and then I'll direct these speakers, the, our speakers to um, to the I'll direct the questions to our speakers during the Q and A session. Okay, so uh, I think we're going to start with uh, Professor Tony Capon. Um, so I'd like to hand to you now, Tony, for your presentation on planetary health. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's Terrific uh, to be with you. Thank you uh, for those words of introduction, uh, uh, Meg. And let me just uh, make sure that I share the screen now. Uh, make that now. How's that looking from uh, to everybody else? 
Okay, excellent. Very good. Um, so, in this talk, um, I've got about 25 minutes. I'd like to do five things. Firstly, to make sure we're all on the same page about this Anthropocene epoch. Secondly, I'd like to uh, think through with you some relevant history and then make reference uh, to the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. The fourth thing I'd like to do is to open it up uh, to thinking ecologically about health, whether that's the health of people or the health of other living things, animals, plants, and indeed microorganisms, and then the so what at the end. So this Anthropocene epoch, our earth science colleagues are arguing that we're entering a new geological epoch. We're leaving the Holocene, which is considered the Goldilocks period for human life on Earth, and entering this Anthropocene, a new epoch in which we're changing Earth systems to such an extent that we'll see this in the fossil record. That includes, for example, climate change, biodiversity loss. And here on this slide, you'll see a link uh, to a Vimeo uh, film, a three-minute film that you may like to look at later, which explains about the Anthropocene Epoch. We'll be sharing these slides um, with everybody, of course. So uh, the Lancet Commission on Planetary Health uh, was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and convened in 2014. I was greatly honoured uh, to be one of the commissioners. At the time, I was directing the Global Health Institute for United Nations University, based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, the commission was convened to understand uh, the future of human health in this Anthropocene epoch. And you can see here uh, the name of the report, the title of the report, Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. A list of commissioners there, and it's notable uh, that they came from a variety of backgrounds. Uh, they weren't all medical doctors, although it was in the Lancet. It was a multidisciplinary group, including um, an expert on One Health, uh, Steve Osofsky uh, from Cornell University in the United States states, but also environmental scientists, economists, uh, political scientists and others. And you'll see at the bottom of this slide that it built on other work, including One Health efforts that we're discussing today, uh, e eco-health efforts, and importantly, the Brundtland Commission. Uh, Back in the 1980s, um, Dr. Gro Brundtland uh, chaired this commission, the World Commission on Environment and Development, and the report, Our Common Future, was published in 1987. And this really introduced the concept of sustainable development uh, to the world. Uh, Dr. Brundtland, in fact, a medical doctor from Norway before she went on to be prime minister of that country and to chair the commission. From the Monash point of view, uh, one of our very illustrious alumni is important in this uh, history too, uh, Professor Tony McMichael, who was the first graduate a PhD graduate in epidemiology at Monash University uh, back in 1972. And this is one of his books, uh, Planetary Overload, Global Environmental Change and the Health of the Human Species, uh, written back in uh, 1993. And more than 25 years ago, uh, Tony, uh, uh, a leader in this field internationally, was already making the case for more attention to these relationships between environmental change and human health. Just having trouble um, moving on. But we can draw that history further back. 
Hippocrates um, back in ancient Greece, more than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates considered a, a, a father of Western medicine as it's practiced now, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which all doctors take. Hippocrates was writing books like this in ancient Greece on airs, waters and places. So he was thinking uh, about the circumstances in which his patients lived and he was making ecological deductions and documenting them in books long before we had modern scientific methods, modern toxicological methods. He was understanding the relationships and listening to his patients and thinking ecologically. But of course, we can also go even further back. Waiora is a Maori word uh, from New Zealand uh, for well-being and healthy waters. And this was the theme of a major conference last year in New Zealand on promoting planetary health and sustainable development for all. This was the the uh, triennial conference of the International Union for Health Promotion and Education. And so Indigenous peoples, whether in New Zealand, Australia, uh, Canada, uh, across Southeast Asia, uh, Indigenous people have always understood that they are part of nature. We as people are all part of nature. We are just one species in the natural environment. So what do we find in that commission report? Well, one thing we found was that by almost any measure, the health of the human population is better than ever before. Here's some World Bank data, life expectancy, as you'll see on the left, from 1960 through to 2010. And that black line in the middle is the world average life expectancy. You can see that in this 50 year period, it's increased from the low 50s through to the high 60s. And now, in fact, it's over 70. But importantly, you'll also see from this graphic that there are gross inequities in life expectancy for Africa and South Central Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, that is a critical issue, the inequities in health outcomes. We also see that in every region, uh, life expectancy has increased uh, through this period, but there's particularly uh, more work to do in these regions. In achieving those health gains, We've exploited the planet at an unprecedented rate. This is the Anthropocene. You can see here escalating carbon dioxide emissions, ocean acidification, energy use, global deforestation, water use, fertilizer use. The list goes on. So what is this idea of planetary health? Put simply, planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And indeed, uh, for some time, we've been understanding these relationships better and better. Here's a schema of links between environmental change and health uh, through the work of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment back in 2005. So on the left of the figure, escalating human pressures on the global environment. In the middle, a list of environmental changes and ecosystem impairments from climate change through forest clearance, wetland loss, biodiversity loss, uh, to urbanisation and its effects. And then on the right, the range of health effects, the direct ones through floods, heat waves, water shortages, landslides, uh, exposure to ultraviolet radiation, exposure to pollutants. Uh, then in the middle, ecosystem mediated health effects, altered infectious disease risk, reduced food yields, uh, depletion of natural medicines, mental health challenges. 
and there at the bottom, the indirect deferred and displaced health effects are those associated with loss of livelihoods, for example, uh, as we see uh, with the bushfires uh, in our country here in Australia uh, last summer, for example, those raging bushfires that made the media all around the world. And population displacements, a conflict and inappropriate adaptation and mitigation. So we can understand these uh, relationships through a range of research methods. And then, of course, in the pandemic, as we uh, today here in Melbourne, we're in lockdown again, uh, trying to avoid the transmission of the coronavirus. But this is only one of these new emerging infectious diseases. Not so long ago, we had H5N1 uh, and SARS here in the Asia Pacific region, uh, Ebola in uh, West Africa, Zika in the Americas. Uh, this pandemic is just the latest one and it's disrupting the world in the context uh, of uh, efforts to prevent widespread uh, uh, health impacts. And air pollution. Uh, having lived uh, in Southeast Asia myself, uh, our colleagues in Indonesia, uh, we understand uh, this seasonal haze uh, across Southeast Asia. And, but more generally, uh, in fast-growing, uh, fast industrialising cities, air pollution is a big health challenge. And each year, WHO estimates more than 3 million premature deaths from ambient particulate pollution, more than 4 million uh, from household uh, uh, burning, uh, uh, often for cooking and heating. So a total of more than 7 million uh, premature deaths around the year, the world each year from air pollution. Importantly though, uh, our work uh, on the Commission, we were clear that uh, we know a lot of what needs to be done. So about half of our report was about getting on with that job, meeting the challenges. It was a hopeful report. We can make changes. Uh, we need to just get on with that and learn as we go. One example is forest conservation, reducing disease risks, work from Brazilian Amazon, similarly relevant uh, in Indonesia, for example, in the northern parts of Australia, uh, reducing malaria transmission in these uh, uh, tropical forest contexts through fewer vector breeding sites, larger vector predator populations, microclimates inhibiting the mosquitoes, acute respiratory infections, the forests filtering the air particles, fewer fires, lower smoke emissions, reduce collection and burning of biomass fuel, and diarrheal disease, the forests reducing flooding and filtering pathogens from surface water. And then the broader economic context, the need for us to transition from our highly consumptive, wasteful economic model uh, to a circular economy model with a focus on reuse, repair, recycling. Perhaps not talking about waste anymore, but understanding that it's all resources and that the byproduct of one process can be and should be an input into other processes. So our conclusions were that solutions do lie within reach, but require a redefinition of prosperity to focus on quality of life and improved health for all, together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. We identified three broad categories of challenges. The conceptual challenges, we might call these failures of imagination. And here, one clear example is the way we measure progress in countries like Australia and Indonesia. We often default to using gross domestic product as a measure of progress. But we need to widen the lens and bring in measures of human development, uh, measures of the state of the environment. Secondly, uh, governance challenges. We might call these failures of implementation. And here, a clear example is that 
we don't take account of the implications of our decisions, the actions we're taking for the well-being of future generations. And uh, this is something that needs to change if we are to achieve uh, the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. We need to be looking ahead and uh, uh, requiring our elected officials to not just think about what their decisions mean for the people that are alive now, the, the voters who might elect them uh, into, into our parliaments, but we're thinking generations ahead as Indigenous people do. And finally, research and information challenges, uh, failures of knowledge, if you like. And here, the need for transdisciplinary research in universities like IPB and Monash. And it's worth just reflecting on the language here. The need to get beyond the disciplinary silos in research, multidisciplinary research, referring uh, to research involving more than one discipline, where each specialist contributes using established con concepts and methods from the discipline. Interdisciplinary, referring to research involving more than one discipline, where there's a modification or mixing together of disciplines uh, to develop new ways of understanding complex problems. Sorry, I hit the wrong button there. And notably transdisciplinary, which I emphasised before and which um, is the approach that we use in our institute, MSDI, and uh, I'm sure you do at, at, at uh, IPB as well. This is about uh, bringing disciplinary knowledge from across the faculties in a university together with the know-how of people from policy, practice, and indeed Indigenous people to create a hybrid which is different from the component parts. And we refer to this as transdisciplinary because we're transcending academic disciplines and valuing know-how from people who are doing things, people in government, people in industry, and Indigenous people. Here's a link uh, to the Commission report on the Lancet website, and there's a range of materials there which are well worth looking at, including video material and a range of short pieces of writing, as well as the 50-page report. I mentioned um, uh, sustainable development and the SDGs, and of course, at the same time as we were developing uh, that report and working together as a Commission, many of us uh, uh, were contributing uh, to the shaping of the 17 SDGs. And from the point of view of health, uh, the World Health Organization encourages us to think about the SDGs in this way with uh, health and well-being, whether it's the health and well-being of people or animals uh, at the center. And all of the other 16 SDGs, if you like, the foundations of health the determinants of health. And there's new research funding for this kind of research. Uh, Wellcome Trust, for example, one of the largest funders of health research has a program called Our Planet, Our Health, and Meg mentioned our RISE program, uh, revitalizing informal settlements and their environments, which is funded under this uh, our Wellcome Trust uh, a program of funding with uh, research uh, in Sulawesi uh, that's underway. And the journals, new journals are emerging here. And you can see on the left, Nature Sustainability in 2018, at, uh, Lancet Planetary Health in 2017. So journals wanting to publish this kind of research, uh, this transdisciplinary research. Now, a few words about human ecology, because I think it's a really important way of understanding patterns of health alongside epidemiology as a core method in health research, whether it's human health research or uh, um, animal health research. And Stephen Boyden, a very eminent uh, human ecologist, uh, wrote this book in 2004, The Biology of Civilization, Understanding Human Culture as a Force in Nature. And uh, Stephen actually originally trained uh, as a vet uh, before he went on uh, to work in this field of human ecology. 
Just a few words about his work. Uh, human, uh, Stephen's work encourages us to understand that all things that people are doing in the world have implications for their health in various ways, whether that's what we might call behavioural risk factors like um, uh, tobacco smoking, for example, or, or unhealthy foods we might be eating or, or lacking uh, physical activity or what, what's sometimes called the social determinants of health, uh, the kind of social safety net that we might provide uh, for others in society, the housing, uh, we have uh, the, um, the transport systems, for example. But importantly, those same human, in, human activities uh, have environmental impacts from uh, that development which are harming the health of the planet in, in, in many ways. Climate change being an emblematic example, but forest loss, uh, biodiversity loss, ecosystem degradation, a range of implications. And then uh, there are flow-on impacts for human health and well-being, as we saw before in that schema, including the health impacts of climate change. These might be called ecological determinants. And then these arrows in the reverse direction, reminding us that it's all one big system, that we're all part uh, of natural systems, uh, humans, animals, microorganisms, plants, uh, we're all part of, of a living earth system. And uh, so here's a link uh, to one of Stephen's other books, which you can download for free. It's called The Bio-Narrative, The Story of Life and Hope for the Future. You can download that from the ANU website at that link. So as I finish in the last couple of minutes, I just want to walk you through uh, this final slide. What's, uh, what does this mean uh, for health sciences, for the sort of work we do uh, here at Monash, uh, the work you do at IPB, whether it's on the health of people or the health of animals? I think the first thing that I would emphasise is that we need to take an eco-social approach to the work we do, recognising ecological, economic and social determinants of health, bringing this alongside uh, biomedical understandings of health and uh, well-being, whether it's humans or animals. Secondly, we need to embrace systems thinking, acknowledging the interdependence of all species on Earth, including those uh, we cannot see the microorganisms. We're spending a lot of time, effort and money to try and squash the coronavirus. And this is very important. But we also need to remember at the same time uh, that to be here and healthy today, enjoying meeting with each other, we need tr trillions of microorganisms, fellow travellers for us as people. So acknowledging this interdependence of all species. Thirdly, intergenerational health equity, not just focusing on the here and now, but thinking about legacy for future generations, critical when we're talking about climate change, of course. And then fourthly, uh, indigenous and local knowledge, whether it's in Southeast Asia, here in Australia, elsewhere, valuing Indigenous knowledge in this transdisciplinary way. And, and we saw this very clearly in Australia with the forest fires last summer, because Indigenous ways of managing the Australian continent actually result in less severe fires, more frequent, less hot fires, less damage uh, to ecosystems, less pollution of carbon, as well as less smoke pollution. And then the fifth uh, uh, message here, that in summary, perhaps what we need is to bring a planetary consciousness to all the work we do, whether it's human health, animal health, whether it's research, training, policy or practice, we need to be conscious of the planetary. At the moment, we're not conscious enough. So thanks very much, Meg. I look forward to the discussion. Many thanks, Tiny. That was really, really interesting. Uh, so I'm going to hand straight away now to 